Good uh, afternoon. I'm Peta and I'm here and I work at uh, the office of uh, alumni here at DBAY. And we are just uh, presenting and introducing uh, a new initiative which is called the Alumni Coffee Talks. The idea was raised in the Alumni Council. The Alumni Council is the body that tries to uh, define and design the policy of its alumni at EBA, and it's, uh, the body is uh, uh, made of different people, basically uh, professors, uh, staff from EBA, and representative of our alumni. The idea of this, this is the first time that we are uh, offering uh, this initiative, as I said, and the idea is to share the experiences of uh, professional experiences of our alumni with the aim of um, enriching the knowledge and, and the way to improve your professional career uh, around the world. So, so far we have three coffee talks. Uh, the first one is the one that we are uh, doing now and then every two weeks we will have on Thursday at 6 p.m. a coffee talk with different uh, alumni. Um, the, the session will be organized as, uh, as follows. First, this, the speaker will uh, talk about the experience he had at eBay and how he jumped into the professional market and then what he's doing and what uh, think what he thinks about uh, the job market and all the ideas he wants to uh, highlight and uh, then uh, during this time people who is attending uh, the assistant uh, the people who is attending the meeting will have the chance to uh, raise or to put questions through the chat once the speaker has uh, 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 stopped or has finished the presentation you will be able to um, interact with him uh, with your I mean uh, with your image and with your voice the reason why in the meantime he's talking the your uh, audios and uh, your camera is are off is because we are recording this uh, session in order to have uh, all the participation of uh, all the speakers in, in and um, disseminate this content uh, through our networks uh, we will see where so i would like to introduce now alejandro and uh, he has the floor he will uh, talk about cyber cyber security thank you Thank you. Uh, well, I will share the file, but I think we have such a small group that we can, I think you can just feel free to interrupt anytime because I'll be, it's a very simple thing, yeah? Uh, okay, I think everybody's seeing it, yeah? Berta, you just say. Okay, sure, I see. Yeah, perfect. So, uh, well, basically it's, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I gotta. So let's let's make a coffee. Yeah, let's have a cafe. Uh, this this idea is I, I love the idea because it's very. I wish I had had something like that when I started. So maybe this could also be useful for for newcomers, not only for for the alumni, but also for the people joining the the master. Yeah, because when you start this uh, kind of studies, you don't know what's gonna happen, and usually it's a big surprise for everybody. You have your pre assumptions and. Your background and your expectations and then life, take, life takes you somewhere else maybe and that was my case yeah, basically so uh the way i will be I try to be short so that we have time to discuss and, and, and talk about real stuff yeah so get your questions and, and things but in order to that i will give you some context yeah first uh, i would like to speak about myself uh which is the boring part i called it uh how did i end in ebay and why did i study this and what was my previous life before eBay. And second, I will go to the cyber security as an activity for international relations. A very interesting activity and a very, it's more open than many people think, yeah? It's uh, not only for techies, not only for information scientists, not only for hackers. There's a lot of field to work. 
So, and then after that, we can just uh, discuss openly and have it relaxed, like a uh, coffee. And we can just uh, in a very relaxed way. It's a pity that we can't meet. Personally, I would love to be in Barcelona. Really, I left Barcelona one year ago and I miss it a lot. And I couldn't go in, I was going to go in July, but I go because of the coronavirus thing. So it's, I really, I'm really missing Barcelona. So I wish I could be there with you. So, um, ah, finally, yes, uh, I also wanted to say that I would like this to be shared because if you see uh, the bottom part, there are lots of links. And those, it's a selection of, it's a selection of things that I found interesting. And I think it's a good starting point to to navigate the world of international relations and, and cybersecurity, which is really, really, really big, and it's growing and changing every second. So let's go for the coffee. First, uh, let's talk about myself, my life before eBay. Uh, I was working when I joined eBay. I've been working for many years. Uh, so eBay wasn't, for me, it wasn't a, it was a dream come true because I wanted to do international relations. That's something I had tried to do incidentally here where I live now. I live in Leuven, close to close to Brussels. Back in the days, uh, year 2000, I, I wanted to do uh, European studies here, but I, I didn't have the money. I was working, I was starting my professional life and I just didn't have the money or the time to, to do it. I was focusing more on my professional life. So it was like a dream for me yeah, to do international relations. My professional life back then and what I studied in my first studies was translation interpreting. I'm one of those constructivist uh, experts. You see this sign here. Yeah? In international relations, as they told us when those, I don't know who said that. I think it was, well, one of our teachers said that, oh, you you linguists, yeah, you translators and journalists and those who speak with language, you love constructivism, yeah, and, and you understand international relations in, uh, from a constructivist point of view. So I'm one of those. My first professional career was, uh, I was focusing on, on translation and interpreting. Then I slowly I moved to technical translation. And then slowly from there, I evolved to language engineering, which is something which sounds very weird, but everybody's using it nowadays. You use Google in your everyday life, you use, uh, voice recognition systems, you use uh, the spell check and all that. Yeah, that's that's language engineering. So that was my career and that's actually what brought me to Barcelona. I was I was going to do my PhD on, on, on language uh, engineering and things changed. <laughs> so basically at some point uh, during my studies in language engineering where I, I got there through translation, technical translation, machine translation, and then language engineering. So at some point, I I was offered a position in Kaiser Bank, in the, in the bank. I was about to start my PhD and I canceled everything. So that was a very, it was what a, a big shift in my career. Yeah, when After so many years working as a linguist, then I had a chance to work as an analyst in, in Kaiser Bank. Uh, I was working in the security department, and we were working on on several fields. Uh, basically, that was actually my first contact with uh, cybersecurity. We were working in the security department to prevent fraud. You know that, uh, I don't know if you know what a phishing attack is, but it's basically when they pretend to be the bank and you get a message, oh, you have to you have to click here and send us your, your security details and ID and your credit card details and everything because you're gonna, we're gonna cancel your bank account. That's a phishing attack, yeah? So those, when I joined Kaisha, it was uh, 2007, they, they were very worried about, about that. That was starting, that was becoming a big problem in, in, in our country, yeah? So uh, I joined the team, I was through language engineering, we were detecting fraud cases. We were looking for specific words, trying to also with uh, all types of scams and everything, yeah? So that's how my, my work for, for Kaisha started, yeah? And we were, I was also designing systems, working in together with uh, the IT department to design systems to capture those incidents and to analyze them properly and to block them yeah, before they affect any customers. From there, I was working, I kept my dream of doing international relations uh, well alive. And at, when was that? I think it was 2010, 2010, 2011, the Icelandic volcano. Do you remember that, yeah? Of, 
most of Europe got blocked. Uh, Europe, well, the northern uh, part of the world, we got blocked. Many people were left in their business trips all over the world. And then my department, we were one of the only teams that were very active on Twitter, uh, detecting new risks and new threats. And we were working very much on, 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 on the internet, basically detecting information. Yeah. That could be a threat. So we said, okay, let's start using this knowledge we have to try and bring the people that we have, because I don't know how many people got lost in this incident, but we had many people, many travelers from, from the bank scattered all over the place. So we started working on, on this uh, through the sources of information. It was uh, um, several websites that were updating information on which airports were getting open. So this is how step by step we started working on risk abroad for the personnel we had abroad. From that little incident with the volcanoes, we managed to bring everybody back safe and sound. Everything worked very well. From that little uh, uh, incident, we managed to build a system where we were working on, uh, together with some vendors, of course, we didn't do you know, holding ourselves, but we were creating a system where we could alert our employees of new risks, of new problems, new, you know, terrorist attacks, uh, earthquakes, everything that was happening. Yeah. So this is this was my first approach to international relations, also analyzing complex situations where there are some, I don't know, some countries like Egypt. Yeah, there was we were talking before about Egypt. Yeah, there was a coup d'état and there were some some big incidents. And uh, we needed to do some analysis. Yeah, the revolution. Yeah, the our management wanted to know what was going on. You know, so that was my first approach to international relations. So in 2011, I joined the masters. It was like a dream come true, and I said, "Oh, I want to study this, and I'm going to use this knowledge to to work on, on as a security analyst." And I love my job and everything. But uh, and actually, I did, I did that. Yeah, it took me forever. I don't know if you've seen that. I was studying in eBay from 2011 to 2016. I was a bad student, basically because I was too busy. <laughs> I didn't have time to. Sometimes I didn't even have time to attend the, the lessons. And it took me forever to finish, but because I was I was combining my studies with a very very demanding professional life, yeah, working like 12, 14 hours, I don't know, weekends and holidays and all that, yeah. So it was difficult to finish, but I managed to finish. And during that period, 2011 to 2016, I was I was working very hard on on that field of international risk and analyzing, and, and I was enjoying that job a lot. It was it was a wonderful experience, and actually we built. I cannot go into details, but we built a very complex system, which is still in force and it's uh, helping our international travelers. Yeah, very, it's a very sound system and very, very complex and it's working very well. So I'm very proud of my little contribution to that. But in 2015, uh, cybersecurity came back to my life. <laughs> uh, there was uh, one of the approaches of, uh, my employer, former employer, and well, actually, it's the approach of several big companies. Uh, since the internet is a multi stakeholder model, uh, it is companies have an opportunity to, to participate in, in, in the internet and, and to define and to, and to take an active role on, on how the internet works. Yeah, the internet also means cybersecurity. So, uh, Kaisha Bank then in 2015. They started a project to, they brought a, an American organization called Anti Fishing Working Group, APWG, to Europe. They wanted to advocate for a safer environment for financial institutions and, and, and their customers in Europe. And they thought that APWG was the best uh, organization. So they decided to sponsor a, a European chapter for this organization with the objective of interacting with European institutions, uh, accessing funding from the European institutions, Horizon 2020 and all those programs, and also working with uh, with different financial institutions from Europe and also companies from all over Europe. Yeah, you know, the European Union is one market, but it's 28, 28, 27, I don't know how many now because the UK, well, a lot of different realities and, and interests. So it's uh, very important. It was very important to have a, to have a, center for operations for this organization and Keisha was very interested in, in, in promoting that 
and actually they are still working there and it's doing great work uh, working on research against phishing, uh, organizing events, uh, collaborating with law enforcement agencies uh, in preventing fraud and preventing the, also facilitating the exchange of information. So uh, I started in 2015. It was wonderful. And then I, I, I could, I was finishing my, my master's thesis, a very bad one, by the way. Uh, not, nothing to do with cybersecurity. I was focusing on other things. I, I should have done something with cybersecurity. I regret that. But uh, we, at that time, I was, I was ready with my studies in the master. I, I was just working on the thesis. And all of a sudden, I could see that many of the things that I had learned in the master were operational. And not only in the way I was working on with them before as an analyst, which was like a, like a close circle. Yeah, they put in my, my reports, my briefs, they would never leave the, the uh, my environment within the, the, the bank. Yeah, but with cybersecurity, I saw that I could interact with United Nations. I could interact with the European Commission. I could organize an event with Europol. I could, um, for instance, we or with the United Nations, we, we organized a little event with the United Nations. I was the United Nations in Vienna. They gave us their, their headquarters in Vienna. We had a space there and we were having a plenary session on, on, on cybersecurity awareness. Yeah? Not to also law enforcement agencies, Spanish police, uh, Slovak police, uh, all the security bodies and companies in, in, in the world, and even ICANN. I don't know if you know what ICANN is. ICANN is the like the big directory of the internet. It's the ones that convert the actual addresses, the IPs, which are numbers, into words. eBay.org, uh, KaishaBank.com, GlobalSavaryAlliance.org. Those words that are human readable. That's ICANN, and they work like the United Nations of, um, of cybersecurity. So all of a sudden, all this uh, world of international relations in an active way, interactive way, the possibility to be influential, the possibility to do things and to interact with uh, institutions and bodies, everything was at my reach. And actually, you could say, okay, you had a powerful sponsor, which was a bank, but it wasn't the case. It's uh, once you step into cybersecurity, you realize that it's a, it's a close circle of experts. They trust each other, they know each other, and they collaborate very closely. And people move from, for instance, from ENISA, which is the European body, to Microsoft, from Microsoft to other, and they keep those relationships. And that's something that I, actually, I don't know if any of you have has worked on, on security, as a, not cybersecurity, but security in general. This uh, trust building, this, uh, Circles of trust are very important for cybersecurity. So in the end, this specificity of the way relations are built there, plus the multi-stakeholder model, it makes that if you work on the field of international relations on cybersecurity, you can reach almost everybody. And that's if your work is, is good and serious, yeah, of course. And that's amazing because for a student or a former student of international relations, you have something that in other fields you cannot, it's very difficult to even to dream of it. Yeah, I don't know, in sectors like energy or uh, defense or uh, human rights, it's very difficult to go to the, I don't know, United Nations, to European Commission, to the, to the, to the, I was talking with the Polish uh, body of, uh, of cybersecurity without much trouble. Yeah, it's reachable. And, and not only talking, you could be influential, you could organize conferences, you could organize European projects, so you could get, pick the phone and, and speak with Telefonica and then with a Polish member and then get something done. And that's amazing, yeah, that's, um, and the good thing is that the criminals, they also do that. They are very good with uh, international relations and, and they know how to how to collaborate very well. So their, their flexibility is also the flexibility of the responders and it's very, very interesting. So this is how I, how I, how I got into that. And uh, at some point, uh, one of my colleagues in APWG, uh, she offered me uh, the possibility to join GCA. I knew the organization. GCA is the Global Cyber Alliance. That's where I work now. That's why I'm living in Belgium. Uh, the Global Cyber Alliance is, uh, is uh, also a perfect model of 
uh, multi stakeholdership and it's it was created by the general prosecutor's office of new york manhattan uh, together with the city of london police so we have public bodies and cis uh, center for internet security which is a non-profit in, in the us they work on on defining and identifying best practices for for small businesses yeah so those three founding members together with a group of big corporations you can see in, there's a link in the in the one in the bottom gca you can see all the members and we have banks we have uh, cyber security companies we have internet companies microsoft for instance ibm those are supporting our mission and our mission is a fascinating one because we are we are trying to address those risks of the internet that nobody can address on uh, individually. So we coordinate efforts and we bring communities together to face big problems like the problem of uh, email security. We are working very hard on a, on a standard called DMARC, which is it exists as we existed before before we were founded, but we are pushing forward to to, to make it a reality. Not only with uh, uh, Gmail, well, the big the big email uh, vendors they already use it, but also with governments, yeah, like the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, they are enforcing this standard. Yeah, we are also working on DNS security. DNS, I told you about ICANN before. When you type an address, or when you sometimes they can take you to a bad site. So we developed something called Quote Nine. Which is a it's a wonderful project. It uh, on average stops 60 million uh, malicious domains and sites every day. So if you're using it, which is, takes 30 seconds to activate, and you get a link to a bad site, you're not going to go there. It's going to be blocked. And that, that's one of the things we do. Yeah, we have uh, good funding. We have a group of people sitting in three continents, 35 of us. And we have very good contacts and we are a very respectful organization and and because we do stuff yeah we we our motto is do something measure it yeah so we have a very active uh approach what we do and we are getting results so that's basically it uh i was offered the position to to as a director of communication and marketing my role here is uh asked me to move to Brussels, to Belgium, uh, to help the EU unit to help it grow. But my role is global, so I'm working globally, although I'm, I'm based in, in Europe. Yeah? And uh, I help, my role basically is helping to build a message around the organization, send our message in different languages, uh, identify opportunities for speaking, uh, opportunities for collaborating, and, and basically making our solutions reachable to anybody. Everything we do is for free. And everything we do is uh, is uh, uh, free to use and no condition to use it. So you don't need to register. You don't need to give any data. It's for everybody. That's we call it cyber hygiene because it's the, we work on the basic things that everybody needs. Yeah, there is a lot of information in the links. Yeah, so. Ah, yeah, Oliana, let me just uh, go to the fun part. I've been speaking a lot about myself. So let's go, let's go very quickly to the fun part. Uh, cybersecurity. I will, I, will, I will get this legal framework in the end because it's one of the links. So uh, first of all, you have to know that cybersecurity is a booming issue. It's one of the, it's growing so much everywhere. There are some, uh, in this link here, you, you can see the figures. It's amazing. It's going to it needs a lot of people it's getting more and more money it's becoming more and more important now with the uh, with the pandemia the pandemic uh, uh, it's become central because many people are doing home office they are working from home and which opens the surface of risk the exposure is has grown dramatically it's a lot of trouble with that lots of attacks so there is a big need for for cyber security and big need for, for professionals uh internet governance and the multi-stakeholder model i don't know if you know how the internet works but it's a bit what i was saying before and this is the reason why it's so fascinating for us some, somebody studying international relations because in the internet you have countries you have associations you have individuals 
you have international organizations and you have special organizations moving around and they all interact and they all have equal equal uh, capacity to be influential yeah so there are individuals that are really influential there are organizations this apwg that i, I the first organization i joined in cybersecurity. there is a very good article uh, from the boston globe that uh, they call them the five guys that are protecting the internet because it's actually it's a group of limited group of people and they are they are, they are doing a lot of stuff protecting the internet yeah uh, so in, in the world of internet, the internet and cybersecurity, there is no United Nations, there is no state level of cooperation. States cooperate with states, but also with companies, with individuals, with uh, civil, civil. It's a mess. It's uh, really a, a very chaotic environment, but uh, things are working and, and, and and in the end, we, we all have internet. We are we are having this conference through the internet. In the end, there are conventions on standards. There are specific groups on on all types of standards. Yeah, for telecommunications, for coding, for it's amazing. So there are technical fields, there are legal fields, there are uh, uh, diplomacy fields. There are countries like uh, Denmark. They used to now they 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 have a, an ambassador in in Silicon Valley, a technical ambassador. That's something that could, in my, in, I don't know, 25 years ago, would be impossible to dream of, yeah, to have a, somebody dealing with internet matters in, in Silicon Valley, in, in San Francisco, representing a country. Uh, and that person, that in, inter, they interact with, with uh, organizations, they interact with companies, they interact with, uh, it's an amazing world. So uh, this model, uh, there is a link here, you can see, you can also explore it at home. It works, uh, the, the link is from ICANN. ICANN is like the paradigm on how this works. ICANN is the, as I told you before, is the organization that converts the IP addresses, the numbers that are not understandable for humans, they convert them into, into domains, yeah? Uh, ebay.org, uh, kaishabank.com, uh, I don't know, whatever, telepizza.es, all that, yeah? they they. They control that, and in order to control that, you have to you have lots of levels of collaboration. You have, on for instance, the country code top level domains. Those representing a country, yeah. .es, .fr, .uk, .it. They work in a way with their specific rules. Yeah. They they sometimes they are connected with governments. Sometimes they are connected with uh, academic institutions. Sometimes they are private companies. And they have their own their own rules and own mechanisms. Then your legacy domains, which are .com, .org, they have their also their own rules. And all of them, they collaborate, and they collaborate in different fields. Yeah, they collaborate on on how to protect from uh, incidents, protect themselves from incidents, how to expand the number of domains to new domains. You know that recently there was uh, now you can have uh, .barcelona, .bank. Those are new. Yeah, whenever some new domains are are created, they have to negotiate. And you have this fascinating world of, uh, of uh, associations negotiating with uh, large corporations, some governments appearing here and there. So it's it's it's, uh, it's it's amazing. So in this link, you can see how the multi-stakeholder model, which is the model that regulates the governance of the internet, how it works. Yeah, uh, how's the how does it work operationally? So uh, as I was saying, the market for cybersecurity is booming and you don't need to be a, an IT person. I'm a linguist and I ended up here. There is a big need for experts in communication, experts in law, uh, also prosecutors, law enforcement agents, analysts, uh, of course, IT experts, uh, economists to understand how the economy of e crime works, uh, all kinds of fields, and actually, psychologists. Uh, to understand what are the mechanisms behind, behind uh, cybersecurity attacks. What do they exploit? Why do people click, even if they're told not to click? Why do they still click? What, what, what moves them to click and to, and to maybe lose the money? Uh, there are also experts in, in, well, in international relations, analyzing the model, how to make it more effective. Yeah? This multi-stakeholder model, as you can imagine, is uh, 
it's very interesting, but it's also very, very slow. And um, many of the problems we have in, inter in the internet is because decision making takes forever. Yeah, and, and some problems they are identified, but they it's very difficult to to solve them. Yeah, uh, all fields. It's an industry that is growing by two digits every every year or every it's maybe this year even more because of the COVID nineteen. And there is a huge demand of experts. So it's something uh, I would really explore if if you are passionate about international relations. It's a field that I think it it would be should be worth exploring. Yeah. So uh, and many paths, many paths because you never know how you can end it. End there. I ended up after trying uh, after. First, I, I started working on language engineering. This my it was my first to cybersecurity, then through international relations. Then by you never know. And and in my in my company, you have former former uh, people from uh, former um, law enforcement officer officers, former lawyers, former policy uh, experts in policy making, computer scientists. Project managers, you never know. So it's a it's a field. If you're interested in it, I I would really suggest to explore it and to have some approaches. And finally, the links, uh, which I won't go through them because it's crazy, but they are. If you see, they they take three lines. The first line is uh, some examples of of international relations on cyber. Yeah. The first one is what the European Union or the Council of Europe in the last case. How influential it is in the world of cybersecurity and internet, the internet in general. Yeah, you know GDPR. Uh, that's the data protection, the European data protection, uh, general data protection regulation of the European Union. It's an international standard right now, so it's everywhere. Everybody's using that, and uh, the, Europe has set the standard for the whole world. Yeah, that's an amazing example. And there, in the in the the conversations to to define that law, the, the European Commission opened them many years ago. People were, 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 associations were giving their opinion, experts. It was a multi-stakeholder model yeah, that created this, this uh, regulation. Then the second thing is the EU-US uh, privacy, privacy shield. Basically, this regulates how your private data go to the US. What uh, you know that most of the big companies on the internet are US-based. Uh, Google, for instance, Facebook, and this uh, shield, privacy shield, was controlling how the data of European citizens were sent to the US. <laughs> this was killed. Uh, they killed it in this summer. So now they are trying to see how to collaborate and how to share that information because there's big issues. Yeah, in, in this, uh, the collaboration is broken, and that's also that was also a requirement for the European Union. Yeah. So imagine the mess the European Union has caused. I've told the Google and all those that the sharing of information will need to be redefined. Yeah, and finally the Budapest Convention that uh, it was also an initiative from well, it's the Council of Europe, but behind it it was the European Union pushing for to create a common international framework to understand what is cyber crime and what definitions do you use for cyber crime. Believe it or not, there are many countries that don't understand cybercrime, many of the activities that the other countries understand. So this is an open field and, and there are really big discussions to, to have a common understanding of uh, of, uh, of what, it, what is a crime on the internet. Yeah, It's essential because uh, the internet is global by, by definition. You can have one in most of the attacks, for instance, a uh, good phishing attack. You can have servers all over the place. You can have servers all over the world. And maybe the server that is sending the the malware or the or the or collecting information is in a constituency that where you cannot reach because they don't follow the Budapest Convention. So they are sitting somewhere in a country that doesn't follow that convention, so it's impossible to prosecute. This is one of the reasons why it's so difficult to 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 so necessary to to have a common understanding, a common framework. Yeah, as I told you before, the multi-stakeholder model applies to the internet, but also to the criminals working on the internet, and they know the flaws of the system. The second level, so the first uh, level, it would be the EU level or, or big international bodies. Second level is how individual countries can be influential in, in what it in cybersecurity and in the world of the internet. Yeah, the 5G, you know, all the issues with the United States and China, Europe in the middle. 
there you have a link to, to explore. Cyber uh, sovereignty. Some there are like let's say three models in the world, uh, two ways of understanding internet and consequently the the world of cybercrime. You have the US and Europe, which would be the democratic models. Each one with a different focus. US are have a clearer focus on on corporate interests and also protecting the interests of the companies and intellectual and industrial property. European Union is more focused on privacy issues, but both of them are democratic models. Yeah, there are mechanisms to 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 protect their citizens. And the third model is the cyber sovereignty model. It's China, Iran, Russia. They have their own way of understanding. They believe the internet is their own sphere. They can intervene in it and they can control what is being uh, they control their telecommunications. Yeah. So that's very interesting. This link you can you can see how how important that is the those debates for international relations and then you have the paris call which is an initiative by one individual country which is france they are trying to define some minimum standards and make them enforceable and try to be to create action and collaboration around those standards the paris call was uh, issued two years ago and you have countries companies and associations uh, as signatories uh, my organization is one of them, yeah? So we are committing to, they have several chapters, and for every chapter you have uh, different organizations committing to make it happen, yeah? Uh, the idea of the Paris Call is move from ideas and declarations to actual, to action, yeah? To, to fight, for instance, in the field of cyber hygiene, it's not only speaking about the need of creating a cleaner internet, but how to do it to make it happen, yeah? So that's, that's one of the chapters. Then at the last level, you have initiatives created based on the multi-stakeholder, yeah, purely. Cyber Peace Institute is a new organization that was created last year, last summer, and uh, basically they want to protect victims of acts of cyber war, basic human rights. For instance, what is, what's an act of cyber war? When the COVID-19 started, several Czech hospitals were blocked by uh, an attack, a cybersecurity attack. That's when they were blocked with people, lots of people coming in, and they were attacked from outside. And many people were kidnapped virtually in their hospitals. They couldn't get the treatments correctly, and they didn't. They, all the information systems of the hospitals were blocked. That's a very bad attack. Uh, I'm not sure if there were victims, uh, if somebody died because of it, but it's a very serious attack that that is playing with human rights yeah so this organization the cyber peace institute uh, works first to minimize those events to to make them uh, something rare and second to prosecute them yeah to remember for instance the cry attack some years ago it also blocked some the health system of the united kingdom for several hours and that's a very very that's a, that that's a very serious attack, yeah, and, and that can have serious consequences. Imagine an attack against um, some critical infrastructure like a uh, power uh, plant that can have really bad consequences. So this one is uh, focusing on that, yeah, on, on preventing the acts of cyber war. Then you have Tech Accord, which is a group of uh, companies that are agreeing a common understanding on cybersecurity and to how to deal with cybersecurity. They have like similar understanding of uh, on how to tackle cybersecurity and, and and how to protect their their customers and their which is very important there you have microsoft for instance they have telefonica we are also part of it we are also supporting that companies and and, and non-profits we are non-profit by the way i don't know if i said that uh then you have the charter of trust uh which was an initiative uh, from siemens and atos in this case, it's not only on how to work with the internet, but how to produce your, their manufacturers of uh, IoT devices and, and all kinds of devices that interact with the internet, how to manufacture devices in a, in a safe and secure way, how to share best practices, how to share, how to incorporate security in the design of, of, of new objects yeah, and new things that interact. Again, it was a private initiative that has that is probably, with the time, may define international standards and, and, and set the uh, standards for for things that we touch and, and have in every house, yeah? from a phone to your computer to your thermostate to the uh, smart fridge that you want to buy or your smart TV yeah? that can listen to your conversation at home. And finally, I included the, the link to my organization so that you can see what we do and how multi-stakeholder it is yeah but, uh, as i said 
public bodies, we have um, private companies, we have associations, also individuals supporting us. So it's a, it's a very complex but very interesting world. And just to finish, if you're interested in the topic and you like international relations, I think this is a field to explore, at least to spend one or two weeks exploring, being curious, seeing where to where it's being discussed, because there are many chances and many opportunities to get your nose into it and to and to eventually find a job because the industry is growing. It's spectacular the amount of money that is this industry is getting. So that's it. I don't know. I'm open for questions or <laughs> here is the my okay. contact details and everything. So Thank you so much, Alejandro, for this such an interesting presentation.